fact, uh, all of our script, main scriptures will be from the book of Genesis tonight. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. Uh, now, Genesis chapters 1 to 11, if you uh, look at those chapters, they tell us about the, how everything began. God said, let there be, and there was. I've often said this, but it does bear repeating. There'll be some people that they've said to me over the course of time, they said, you mean to tell me you really believe that God created all that is in seven days? I said, no. And they'll say, well, that's good. We thought you were one of those people. I said, yes, yeah. I don't, uh, he created in six days. He rested on the seventh. And they're like, you are one of those people. All right. But uh, you say, why do you believe that? Because Scripture says so. And, uh, and God created all that was and tells about the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. And some people will say, well, and, and we may have a message coming up on this in the not-so-distant future, but people will say, well, why was eating the forbidden fruit such a big deal? Well, because God defines sin. We don't define sin. God defines sin. And, uh, you know, thing, even, even, uh, you know, even murderers, mass murderers, you ask them, and some of them will say, well, I only killed 20 people. You look at this other mass, but he killed like 50 people. So they think they're okay. Because they, how many know we would look at that and say, what are you talking about? But how many know God's definition of sin is, is what rules and reigns? And so we have the fall of man and the fall of all the created order. Then Genesis chapter 4, we have Cain killing Abel. Genesis chapter 6, the intent of man's heart was evil continually. God destroyed all that was with a flood. Noah and his family and the animals remained through that. We come to Genesis chapter 11, and we have the Tower of Babel built. God had told them to disperse over the face of the earth. Rather than do that, they joined together and they built up a tower so that they would have a great name to reach into the heavens. God put an end to that. He dispersed them over the face of the earth, confused their languages. And then beginning in Genesis chapter 12, God picks a man. And that man is Abram, or as he will become known to us, uh, Father Abraham, as we would say, Abraham. Uh, that name, by the way, many of you will be familiar. Abraham sounds like Ab or Abba. It comes from the same word as Father. You know, in the New Testament, Paul will tell us in the book of Romans and in the book of Galatians that those who are redeemed, adopted into the family of God, those who are in Christ, we've not received the spirit of bondage, leading unto fear again, but we receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. All right? Like he's our daddy. He's our father, our heavenly father. And so Ab, that root word, is where we get Abram or Abraham. Abram means father, and many of you will know his name was changed by God to Abraham. There's certain times in Scripture when people's names are changed, and Abram, Abraham is one of those people. Abram means father, Abraham means exalted father, and he picks this one man, Abraham, and through him is going to come the Savior uh, centuries later. So, chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house. To the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now you see up there I have family tests. And you'll see about these tests in a moment. But... Uh, Abram, or Abraham, is called the father of our faith. And how many know we don't like it, but there are times when our faith is tested, when our faith is tried, isn't there? In fact, I was at the hospital today with my dad at about 3 in the morning, and uh, about 3.30, I guess. I was, I was with him there at the hospital as they were getting him uh, settled. And again, he's doing much better. Appreciate your prayers for him. But uh, I was there with him, so I missed out on going to work today. I missed out on going to, to school today, and I was given a test. And tests are happy. I mean, they're, uh, they're different days. And, uh, and I missed out on giving the students a test today. I just, I love, I mean, I'd like to give tests. And uh, so I missed out on that today. But uh, Lord willing, I'll be there tomorrow. They didn't finish their test. And some will say, uh, the students will say, Mr. Strunk, you like to give tests? I said, trust me, teachers are tested all the time. And uh, uh, test days is when we get to return the favor just a little bit. But, uh, but there are tests of our faith, aren't there? Nobody likes tests, do they? How many here just mostly didn't like tests when you were growing up, right? Nobody likes them necessarily when they are coming. In fact, we pray for them not to come, and rightly so. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, part of the Lord's prayer is, lead us not into temptation. Now, 
Uh, we say temptation, of course, James will tell us God doesn't lead anybody into, he doesn't tempt any man with evil because he can't be tempted by evil himself and neither does he tempt any man. But testing is, a, is perhaps a, a, a greater look at Matthew 6, 13, the Lord's prayers that we pray not to be tested, although sometimes we are tested, aren't we? But we don't like to be tested, do we? And that's, that's understandable. But even though we don't like to be tested, how I many know sometimes tests can be good? They, they can. James chapter 1 says this, verses 2 to 4. It says, count it all joy when you encounter various testings or trials. Uh, King James will say temptation, but uh, uh, it's like the word, uh, we think of temptation with some evil connotation. But it, it's like, it says, count it all joy when you encounter various trials or various testings. Knowing that the trying or the testing of your faith produces endurance or patience. And patience or endurance, when it's had its full effect, will leave you perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If I said, how many would like to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing? Everybody would say, how many would say amen to that? Amen. Right, if I said that. But then, <clears throat> see, I shouldn't have given you the whole verse. I'm on three hours sleep. I'm a little rusty. I gave you the whole verse, so you heard it, the whole thing first. I should have given you the hook first, and then come in with the kapow, all right? So pretend or rewind, all right, is that you'd like to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, but it says this, it's the trying of our faith that produces patience or endurance, and this is what leads to that perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So tests can have good benefits, can they not? Even though we don't like them. I will tell you another thing about tests is this, as a teacher, I can tell you, I can give a test. I wasn't there today, but if you were to give me a list of my students on a roll sheet, I could probably go down that roll sheet and be within 10 points of what most every student got. Because as a teacher, once you get to know your students, all right, I give the test, but I pretty much know what they're going to make. But what does the test do? The test reveals to them how much they know or how much they know that they might not know just yet. All right? And how many know when it is that we have a test of our faith, it's not as if somehow God gets some information that he wouldn't have be privy to otherwise if the test hadn't occurred. But how many have ever been through a test and you got some information that you needed to know, right? And so there are tests that we go through in our faith and those tests can be good even though we don't like them. And when we come to Abraham who's associated as the father of our faith, we're going to go through some tests. Now, I, you know how I like words that start with the same letter, so I, I think it helps you remember sometimes. The first test is the family test. And what I mean by that. Here is Abraham, or Abram as he's known now, and he's in his hometown, and he's there with his family, he's there with his surroundings, where he has been, and he's 75 years old. I mean, 75 would be a hard time to be told to get up and go somewhere else, right? And so here it is, he's 75 years old, and he is told by God to go out of his country, out of his homeland. He's not even told exactly where to go, he's not given... Uh, a road map or an atlas or if young folks are in here. You know, at school I talk about atlases and maps and they're like, I, I said, okay, map quest and GPS. Oh, now they know what I'm talking about. How many remember when maps used to be on paper? Yep. And now there's nothing on paper anymore, right? It's all on screens and you hope they're telling you, right? And then you put in the GPS and they just say perform U-turn when possible everywhere. I bet. At any rate, here it is, is that he's told to go out from his own country and leave his family uh, so to speak, leave his kinfolk, which he doesn't exactly follow through on all that. He does take his dad with him and his nephew, and his nephew, uh, his dad, which is Abraham's brother, had died, if you read in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 11. So Abraham takes his dad and he takes his nephew with him, and he does leave his homeland. But Abraham, he's called by God, he's told to do something, and with a, a little bit of exception insofar as taking his dad and Lot with him, he does leave all of his surroundings, leaves his other families, and goes to a place which he doesn't even know for sure where that's at. But he leaves, and Hebrews will tell us he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. And so he leaves. Can I tell you, when I talk about the family test here, I'm not talking about you necessarily having to leave your family. How many know family is ordained by God? Right? You have Adam and Eve in the garden, a man and a woman that would be the very definition of marriage. And then what do you have? The scripture will teach us that uh, when one uh, couple is married, they leave their parents' house and they cleave to one another. And then when they, it is that they have children, that the children are to honor their mother and father. 
And that the marriage commitment is, is sacred. And Jesus will say that uh, it, the adultery or, or uh, Paul teaches in the New Testament abandonment. And we might say a, abuse, although that one gets a little tricky. But there are very limited reasons for divorce. Now, that doesn't mean there's not forgiveness, all right? But there's very limited scriptural reasons that would be justifiable of which there would be no need to repent. And I, I say this, again, there's forgiveness. I'm very thankful there's forgiveness. But the family is held up as honorable in God's eyes, although in society, how many know it's being put down, put down, put down, put down? I will tell you, you can see it every day when we go into the school where I work at. And I'm just talking about the system, the, the, the overarching school system. When they tell kids they're having trouble, you listen to them. I listen carefully. And my brother here will be able to tell you too. You listen carefully. You know what they're told? If they're having a problem, seek out a counselor. Seek out an administrator. Seek out a trusted adult. Does somebody see a problem with that? A counselor, a trusted adult, an administrator. How about your parents? I always point the kids. Anytime we have an assembly like this, I'll say, you need to, you say, well, uh, ben, maybe their parents are dead. It could be. But I will tell you, overall, it's the parents that the kids need to go to that are responsible for the kids, not the overarching system. Yeah. All right? So the family is an elevated thing. All right? And, and so I, but I, when I say the family test and Abram leaving his family, I don't mean to diminish family. I simply mean this, that our first and foremost commitment to be true is to, be, is to, uh, is to God. How many want to be committed to God? In fact, I remember one time many years ago, there was an a unequally yoked couple that uh, had come to me for, for, a, for a counseling. And one of them was a friend of mine, the, the brother who was a brother in Christ. And his wife was not saved. They both got married when they were unsaved. And they were about to do Splitsville. And, uh, and I went to his wife and I, says, I said, I know you don't understand this. I said, but he's committed to this marriage because scripture, I know scripture doesn't have the authority to you, but to him, scripture tells him that unless it is that you were to leave, he's to be committed to this marriage, and he is committed to this marriage. And I want you to know what kind of, no, I checked it out with him that I could talk to her, and they all, they wanted me to talk to her. I said, I, said, and I know you don't understand that. I said, but he's committed to this in scripture, and that's, what, that's where he is at. Now, I don't know where you're at or where you're coming from, but I want you to know where he is. And maybe he can't explain that to you in the way that I just did. Maybe he doesn't have the words, but I went over the verses. And thank the Lord they stay married, and I'm thankful for that. Okay? I pray she becomes a believer, all right? But that's been many years ago, and to the best of my knowledge, she's not become a believer, but they stay together. And so uh, family is something to be elevated, but do understand this. Jesus will tell us in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, that unless one hates his father and his mother and his, and, and his wife and his children and his brothers, he cannot be his, the disciple of the Lord. And you say, well, how does that jive? It jives like this. Our love for the Lord is to be the overwhelming prerogative and priority of our faith. Now, you may say, well, what if that conflicts with something else? Well, it may from time to time, but do, and always obey God over man, but do understand this. The more committed we are to God, the more faithful we are to God, the more faithful we're going to be to our family. The more faithful we're going to be to the commitments that God would have for us to be. Amen? So here it is, is that Abraham, this family test, he, God called him and he went out. And I will tell you, here is, again, shadowy kind of pictures in the Old Testament of what's to come in the New. But notice, God calls, Abraham goes a different direction. How many know that's how it is in salvation? God calls, there's repentance, and those who have repented, you go a different direction, right? Now, next is this, <clears throat> Genesis 13, verse 5 to 9, the fellowship test. It says, now Lot, and just to refresh your memory, Lot is Abram, or Abraham's nephew. Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Here is Abraham 
he comes to his nephew Lot. And God has blessed both of them. And they both have multitude of flocks and of men that are under their charge. And the land isn't able to support all of them where they're at. And strife arose. How many know that tends to happen sometimes? <laughs> this side of war, there can be strife. Even amongst brothers. Right? I've mentioned before, but some old wise uh, minister said this one time. He wrote, wrote in a book, Warren Wearsby. He said this, to live with the saints above will be such glory. But sometimes to live with the saints below is quite another story. Right? I mean, no, that can be true. There can be strife. And so there's strife. What does Abraham do? Abraham, now notice, he is the one who's the elder. He's the one who was called by God. He's the one who should be the, I mean, if we were to think of this and write this up in a movie, Abraham would go to Lot and would say, hey, there's strife between us. You go over there. I'm going to go over here. Have a good day. All right. And something like that, right, is how we would draw it up in the world. Abraham should be the man in charge. He's the one that got the call from God. He's the old one. Lot is his nephew. But what does Abraham do? Abraham, in the spirit of Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Romans 12, 18, by the way, it's a short little verse, but it's a good one that will help us a lot in our character and in our relationships, in our fellowships. It says this, as long as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Now, I tell you, there's a lot of times when it depends upon us and we're not at peace with others. There are lines to be drawn, but those lines aren't when it violates what we think we should have or what we think we should get or where it thinks we should be. It's where God draws his lines in his word. If someone's violating God's word, well, now that's not up to me anymore. That's God's word. But if it's up to, hey, you know, I, I wanted this land over there, but you want that same. Well, you know, Abraham's, Abraham's willing to be at peace with all men, so long as it depends upon him. Abraham has the attitude of Christ, and illustrated in Philippians chapter 2, that we are to consider others' interests above our own, and not just to look out for ourselves. And what does Abraham say? He goes to Lot, and Abraham figured that if he cast his lot with God, that his lot would be the best lot, no matter what lot that Lot selected. That was a lot. Did you get that? I know it's getting late, right? But uh, he, he went and he told, told Lot, he said, you pick out whichever way you want and I'll pick the other. And those who are familiar with the story know this. Lot selected the best looking land. And why wouldn't he? How many know that's human proclivity? I pick out the best for myself and you do the best you can for yourself, all right? And so at uh, Lot, he picks out the best looking land, which happened to be towards Sodom. Kind of a side message here, but I pointed it out in messages before speaking about Sodom and Gomorrah. But Lot, first it said his eye was towards Sodom. Then he camped near Sodom. And then he ended up living in Sodom. And how many know that's how it goes, right? With all kinds of sin. You cast your eye that way, and then you get a little closer. But how many know you can't get close to the fire and not end up getting burned, right? And so eventually he ends up living some. But here it is. Abraham is willing to lay down his own desire. He's willing to be humble. He is humbling himself. And how many know? Nobody humbled themselves more than our Lord. Oh, when he went to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, Paul can tell the church at Philippi to be in fellowship with one another. And to not have divisions with one another. And to look out for others' interests. And you know why Paul can tell them to do that? Because he says, that's the mind of Christ, the mind that Christ had in himself, who although he was equal with God, wasn't robbery for him to be equal with God, that he came from heaven to earth, and from earth, so to speak, to live as a man and as a servant, and to die, and die a terrible death on the cross, look very humbly. But because of that, God raised him and gave him a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Amen. Father. Amen. And so here it is. There's the fellowship test. And I tell you, faithfulness to, to God. We're talking about Abraham, the man of faith, and test of our faith. Fellowship with one another can sometimes be tested. Somebody say amen. Help us, Lord. Lord right? right? 
And don't look at me when you say that. But, all right. But it can sometimes be that. But I will tell you that to, when it is that we are a part of the family of God, well, I need you and you need me and we need each other. Ephesians chapter 4 will say that we're to attain to the unity of the faith, the bond of the spirit. How many want to pass, so to speak, the fellowship test? Look here next. Genesis chapter 14, 14 to 16, the fight test. Now I got your attention. Some of the, the fight test, verse 14. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he let out his trained man, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. Now, I won't go in depth into this, but basically remember the last verse passage we were at earlier on in this chapter. Lot chose to go towards Sodom. And if you read all of chapter 14, there arose a difficulty and these other kings came in and they conquered Sodom and they took the people and they took all the goods. Well, Abraham hears about what has happened to his relative and what does he do? But he says, I'm going to go and fight and get them back. And so Abraham takes his men and fights and wins back the people and the possessions that had been conquered, of which Lot, his nephew, was one of them. He was willing to fight for his relative. How many know there are some things worth fighting for? Jude 3. You say, what chapter? 1. <laughs> if you have any Bible that has more than one chapter in Jude, you got the wrong, the wrong Bible, okay? Uh, but Jude... Verse 3, chapter 1. There's only one chapter. Jude, who was the half-brother of the Lord, he said he wanted to write different things to them about encouraging them in the faith. But God, the Holy Spirit, convicted him that he was to write and teach them to contend earnestly for the faith. Verse 3, which was once delivered to all the saints. Contend means to fight, to fight for the faith. How we know the faith is worth fighting for? And there are times, now, again, the, the color of the carpet, and people have, I tell you, churches have had, have had trouble in the past about the color of the carpet or the, the, the color of the pew. There was one church I know of that had a split because they called their get-togethers potluck, and somebody thought that was unspiritual. They wanted to call it pot blessing. How many know that's, that's, that's not worth the, Right? Uh, but there, there's fights that Christians can engage in that aren't worth fighting for. And in fact, it would set a bad witness to the world. But there are some things that are worth fighting for. Someone that has a faith that they won't ever fight for, I, their faith is, is, is wind and, and they're carried about by every to and fro, by every wind of doctrine because there is an anchor worth fighting for. You talk about contending for the faith. What are some elements of the faith? The Bible is the word of God. Somebody says it's not. That's worth fighting over. Jesus, he's the only way of salvation. There is salvation in none other. He's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. And someone wants to say there's some other way. Or it's Jesus plus something. That's worth fighting over. Why? Because don't patronize Jesus. Either you believe what he said in his word or go follow something else. But he said in his word, he's the only way. Someone wants to say that Jesus is just a man, or just a great teacher, or just a great prophet. No, no, no. Jesus is, again, he is God in the flesh, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. I heard someone quote John 14, 6 one time, and they had been in the Word many, 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 many years and should know better. It's one thing to misquote a verse. I'm sure I've done it a time or two, not intentionally, but I'm sure I've told you it was 14.6 and it was 15.5 or something. All right, I don't mean to, but you ever call me, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, but, or, or I maybe have a, 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 a the, the tenor of the verse is right, but it might not be worth it. It's one thing to have that happen. But this fellow said, he said, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father unless they come the way they see me doing it. What is that? I had never seen that anyway. That seems like salvation is works-based in some way. He is the way. I cannot make the way. I cannot do the way. All I can do is by his grace and for his glory be in the way. Amen. 
And here it is. If someone wants to say there's some other way of salvation, no. Someone wants to say there's some other word from that the Bible isn't the word of God, no. Someone wants to say that uh, somehow, you know, you can believe whatever you want, die and still go to heaven, no. Someone wants to say there is no such thing as hell, no. We fight over these sorts of things, all right? And we fight for our brothers and sisters, too. Notice that's what Abraham was doing. He's fighting for our brothers and sisters. Anyone ever heard the verse, rest assured your sin, not? will finally drop. Anybody ever heard that verse? Yeah. That's in the Bible. Right. Do you know what context is? The context is, is that the tribes of Israel, they are on their way into the promised land. And I can't remember the names of the tribes, but two of the tribes, they want to stay on one side of the Jordan River and make their abode there instead of going on with the rest of the people of God. And Moses says, when it comes time to fight, though, you better fight, or rest assured your sin will find you out. Not fighting for your brothers and sisters, that's something that's a problem. We need to fight for our brothers and sisters. Even in church discipline, Matthew chapter 18. Why is it that we would go to a brother that's in a sin? Why is it that we would go to them instead of... I tell the kids at school all the time, I say, if your parents confront you about something that you're doing wrong then you ought to be glad because there's some parents that won't do that because they don't care not to say nothing. They'd rather not make you upset and they don't care. I said, me as a teacher, I'll call them up and I'll talk to them up at the podium. I said, now you're going to have to sit up front because your test score said that you need to, you're not being bad necessarily, but you need to pay closer attention. You need to sit up front. And I know you don't like that, but do you know why I'm doing that little Susie Q? And she'll say, why, Mr. Strong? I said, because I care. And I do care. And that's why I have them do that. Why? Why do I go through the trouble of that? It'd be easier just to let them sit back. But you try. Now, you can't win them all by any means. <laughs> Amen. Lord help us, all right? You can't win them all, but you try to win what you can. And I will tell you, we, we, we care about our brothers and sisters. Paul in Galatians chapter 2. When someone is great, I will tell you. Back in the day that Galatians was written, if there was a Johnny come lately, it was the Apostle Paul. Peter was the established Apostle. And yet Peter, he didn't engage in, uh, he didn't engage in, in, in utter uh, uh, apostasy or in uh, teaching, uh, uh, you know, false things. But he was hypocritical in the way that he was behaving, for sure. And he was giving the impression that somehow people had to follow the law in order to be saved. And what does the Apostle Paul do? Because of his, his wanting to fight for the truth and fight for his brothers and sisters, he confronts Peter to his face about what it was he was doing that gave a false impression. How many know there are some things we're fighting over? The faith is worth fighting over. The essentials of the faith, our brothers and sisters, are worth fighting for. Again, you can't win them all, but that scripture isn't just like, well, just forget about it, right? No, we, we pray and we, 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 we love our brothers and we love our sisters. How many are thankful that somebody that you may don't even know but was fighting for you in prayer before you was even saved? Amen. You say, was somebody praying for you? I could almost guarantee you somebody was. All right? Uh, how many have been thankful that somebody's been praying for you even since you've been saved? You know, a brother or sister comes up and says, how so-and-so doing or such-and-such going? That you told them about. And you're thankful somebody's fighting, right? Yeah. Don't just give it up. Now this one might be harder. But you ever had a brother or sister come and say, Hey now brother, uh, you know, I love you. And I'm telling you this because I love you. This or this or this. And I, I really think things will be. But how many are thankful for that too? How, wouldn't you rather somebody yeah, get you to turn around the, on the road than just let you feel good driving off the cliff? Right? So here it is, uh, Abram, he cares and he's willing to fight. That's a test of our faith. Or do you, we just have no fight in us. Fortune test, Genesis 14, 21 to 24. The king of Sodom said to Abram or Abraham, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal palm or anything that is yours, for fear you would say I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. A nair, eshkol, a mamre. Let them take their share. Now what happened here again was Abram went and he fought with these kings that took over Lot and Sodom and these other areas. And he got back the people and he got back the treasures. 
And he goes back, and the king of Sodom says, let the people stay, but all of our stuff, you can have it, Abram, because, I don't know, Abram saved your life. He said, you can have it all. And I tell you, if Abram would have been a lot like the mercenary, I mean, minister, I mean mercenaries that are on TV in some places today, he said, oh, 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 yes, bring it on in. I, you know, you got a bigger jet plane or more jet fuel or more jet something that you wish they'd just jet somewhere. But at any rate, right, yeah, that, that he might have said something like that. He might have taken it and said, I'm in the money. All right, you don't know. But Abraham says this. He says, no, I want to take what I need to, to deal with my man here. But no, I'm not going to let it be said that you somehow made Abraham rich. That somehow you were the source of my provision or the source of, of what came into me. Ab How many know that is something the fortune test is a test of faith that many fail. I heard someone say one time, they, uh, they were talking in a ministerial kind of sense and said, three things that ministers fall into, gold, glory, and gals. They all started with G, all right? And how many know that does tend to sum up a lot of the things that people fall into? And one of the main ones is gold, that is the money, the fortune test. How many times have you heard it be that, you know, preachers are always called money grubbing preachers, right? And many of them are. With, with they gain that reputation, dishonest, however you want to describe it. They've gained that reputation. They tell you, send it into them. I've heard all sorts of things, and no doubt you have too. I've heard people on there that have jet planes, and they'll tell people that, that they'll, they'll even say, send me your social security check because you need the blessing that comes from that more than you need that check. I'm like, you're flying a jet plane, you want them to send them your social security check. You ain't even talking about them being in a local church somewhere, and you won't ever even know their name. I mean, look, there's a problem with that. Right? And here it is, that, that here it is, they, they could come, and, and, and Abraham could have gotten all of this stuff, but he said no. We hear a lot of messages, particularly those who are popular in our day and time. The most popular ones will have messages telling us about how to get wealth and be wealthy and have these sorts of things. I'm not saying that there's a problem necessarily. I mean, no, God does have, he seems to be okay with people being blessed with certain things. And aren't you thankful for that? Nothing wrong with hard work and there being a reward for it. Nothing wrong with being wise and what have you. But I will tell you, I wish we heard just as many messages about the warnings that go to those who have a lot of this world's substance because Scripture is filled with those warnings. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, The love of money is the, sort of all, is the root of all sorts of evil, or King James will say the root of all evil. Covetous hearts cause murder, says uh, the book of James. 1 Timothy chapter 6 will go on. If we have clothing and shelter and food therewith, we should be content. When was the last time you heard a message on that? And here it is. I say that because of this. Again, not to say that God wouldn't bless you with certain of uh, this world's substance that you would use as he would have you to for his glory. But to say this, there is danger in too much of this world's substance of which we must be careful or it will eat us alive. And here it is, Abram, he wasn't going to let that happen. We were last week. Remember last week's message? Raise your hand if you remember. Everything's <laughs> 18. Just like school. Just like school. <laughs> I tell them, I, I could tell them the formula for the area of a circle is pi r squared. And they come the next day and they say, Mr. Strunk, pies aren't square, pies are round. Some of you get that a little later on, all right? I can teach on some of it. I don't, now listen, I do remember last week's, if you asked me two weeks ago, though, even though I preached it, I might not remember what it was, but I do. Last week's message, it was Nimrod, Naaman, and Naboth, if you remember that. And Naaman, remember Naaman was the guy that was a, he had leprosy, and he was a head up in the Syrian army. And he goes to uh, the prophet Elisha, and he ends up, through a series of events, he ends up being healed of his leprosy. And I won't re-preach that, but it is there if you want to go listen to it. If you forgot it, it's online. All right. But at any rate, as he goes there, does Naaman, and he's healed of his leprosy. And it's a picture of, of salvation. How many know we're not saved by our works or by our resume or saved by any money that we can have or any worldly connection we can have? We're saved by God's grace. 
by the truth of his word. The leprosy is cleansed and we're born again with skin just like a baby. How many are thankful for that? Like a newborn, all right? See, it's coming back to you. I remember that. That's good. But the Bible here is that after that, I didn't read that whole passage. If you read that whole passage in 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman comes back to Elisha, the prophet, and says, Hey, I've got all this gold and silver, several hundred pounds. I want to give it to you because look at what's happened to me. And what does Elisha say? He says, no, I don't want you. To he didn't want him to think that somehow he had bought his miracle or bought what had happened to him. He said, nope, nope. You go and take it your way. Far be it from me. So Naaman goes, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, he saw this and he said, well, now this ain't right. We should have got a little something anyway. And so he chases Naaman down. And he says, you know what? He tells a lie. How many know lie, lie, and covetousness go together, right? Sins go in spirals, don't they? Where there's one, you're bound to find another. And maybe another as well. He goes, he lies, and he tells Naaman, he says, we have this need that just came up. So we need some money, and we need some change. And Naaman says, no problem, here, take this. And so Gehazi, he takes it, and he hides it out, and he goes see Elisha. And Elisha says, where have you been? Nowhere. Did not my heart go with you? I knew where you were. I know it. And the leprosy of Naaman came right upon Gehazi. How many know he didn't get the bang for the buck he was looking for? I will tell you again, the fortune test, whether we, we, it, with, uh, with, with money and how we handle those sorts of things, it can be a, a big deal. Can I tell you, you look, many people say, you ever heard any Bible teacher say that the Bible says, more about money, especially Jesus said more about money than he said about any other thing. You might have heard, heard such a statement before. You know, it's not true. It's not true. And what, what I mean not true is this. It might be true that Jesus used money for uh, illustration, but he wasn't talking about just, you know, how to manage your finances and he wasn't angling for an offering. All right? He talked about it because that's where people's heart was at. And he used it as an illustration to get to people's hearts. So in one sense, it's kind of a half-truth, I guess. He did talk about it, but he was trying to get at something deeper. He wasn't angling for an offering or trying to give you a financial seminar. All right? And so here it is. Uh, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And if you look here, Abraham, how many think he passed the fortune test here? He was willing to forsake the things of this world as far as having them as his source, anyway. Look here next, the future test, and this will be the last one. Genesis chapter 22, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, a very famous passage. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father. Now, this is many years later. Abraham is over 100 now, uh, somewhere between 110 and 120, give or take. And he has his son Isaac now. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Abraham said, Here I am, my son. And Isaac said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Verse 9, Then they came to the place to which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And your seed, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, we have preached on that verse in uh, 
to drill down in, in the past, and it's worth drilling down into. I mean, that is one of the best passages of Scripture. I'll give you a little, I've mentioned this before, some of you may remember, but when I first started studying the Bible seriously, I was about 16, 17 years old. And I'd been in church, and I was saved about the age of 14, but as far as like studying the Word of God seriously, about 16 or 17 years old. And I'm sitting at the bowling alley. My dad was bowling. I like to joke about this. We were so spiritual. We bowled at Miracle Lanes. Miracle Lanes. Somebody say amen. Now that's spiritual there. Some of you, are, anybody remember Miracle Lanes? Anyone lived here long enough to remember where it's at? Uh, or where it used to be. It's tore down now. It used to be across the street from Edison Mall. If you're familiar with it, they tore it down many years ago. But we bowled at Miracle Lanes. And I was sitting beside, behind my dad and I would sit there. And while he was bowling, I'd sit behind there and I'd, I'd read my Bible. Two or, he had two leaves on a Monday night. It took about three or four hours. And I'd sit back there and I'd read the Bible. And I figured I'd start at the front. And I got to Genesis chapter 22. And when it said the Lord will provide himself as all for that's the first time I ever remember crying over a scripture verse. Right there in front of the bowling alley and everybody. The Lord will provide himself. This, and I thought. I mean, I didn't know enough of the Bible to know all the ways that pointed to Christ and his I didn't know it, uh, a lot of things. But I knew what, that right there, the Holy Spirit illuminated to me that night. The Lord will provide himself. In other words, way back in Genesis, God is telling us the sacrifice for sin will be the Lord himself. He will provide it. He will be it. And how many are thankful for that? And I tell you, that just that passage always ministers to me because it's one of the like I said, the first time I remember just sitting there and I just couldn't control myself. It was just like tears right there in, in the middle of the bowling league. I don't know if Dad got a strike or a spare or what he got, but at any rate. Genesis chapter 22, you're familiar with the passage. Abraham is told to offer up Isaac, his son. And in Genesis 22, Isaac is called by God, your son, your only son. Now, technically speaking, Abraham had a son, Ishmael, who was the older son, but that was not the son through whom the promise of salvation would come. Isaac was the son. Isaac was the seed. As Paul will talk in the New Testament, that God told Abraham, through your seed, not seeds, but through your seed, will come the blessing of all the people. That means that seed was singularly talking about Christ who is to come. And that blessing was to come through Isaac. Not through Ishmael. And notice, what does John 3.16 say? God so the Lord again, his only begotten son. Same kind of wording used all the way back to your dish. You say, well, that was Old Testament. John's New Testament. Removed by hundreds and hundreds of years. You'd think that the same God was writing those books, wouldn't you? If you didn't know. All right? Now, don't listen to the world that will tell you something different. God knew. Uh, only God could be as brilliant to write a book like this. Right? And so here it is. He tells Abraham in this same term, your son, your only son, to go and offer him up. And here they are, Abraham and his son Isaac, and they're going up Mount Moriah where Christ will be crucified many hundreds of years later. And he's going up there and he's got wood on his back, right? How many know the picture here is just it's beautiful? And Isaac says, Dad, hey, we got everything set to sacrifice. God will provide himself a sacrifice. And they get up there, and I would tell you, eight, uh, Isaac was old enough now, he might have been as old as, you know, late teens, early 20s, something like that. And I forget, I looked up the age one time specifically, but he's not like a little boy, all right? He could have fought back against his hundred and some year old dad, but he didn't. He willingly let, how many think, well, Christ willingly laid down his life. And here it is, Abraham goes to kill his son, and just at the point, an angel says, don't. How many know some couple thousand years later, God would let the, his wrath come down on his own son? And then there's a ram that comes out of the thicket with a crown, out of the thicket, a crown of thorns on his head. I mean, that's a beautiful picture right there, too. And it comes out, and Isaac lives. He received him back, says Hebrews, by faith Abraham, when he was what? Tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son, Isaac, his only son. It was he to whom it was said, and Isaac, your descendants, shall be called. Verse 19, Abraham considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which he also received him back as the type that Abraham believed. Even if God had him go through with it, that he could raise him back from the dead. And how many are thankful God can raise it, man? 
and Jesus was raised from the dead. And if you're in him, you've been raised from the dead. You said, I ain't even died yet. Listen, can I tell you, if you're in Christ, you've been born again, raised to walk in a newness of life. And now there is a resurrection that's going to come for he that believes in the one who is the resurrection and the life, though he were dead, yet shall he live. How many are thankful for that? And so here it is, is that going back to Genesis 22, Abraham was made this promise that he's going to have all of these children, and he's only got one, Isaac. Where are they all going to come from? And especially if the one dies, where are they all going to come from? Back then, you know, that's where the, even today we have this kind of mindset, right? That how is it that our family name lives on through our Children through our descendants, right? In fact, you look, you go back to Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, right? It talks about that suffering servant, Jesus, dying, but then it says that he will see his offspring. How would he see his offspring? Because he rose from the dead. The, the, the resurrection, as well as the crucifixion, is in Isaiah 53. Okay? But here it is, anyway, going back to Genesis 22. Abraham received this promise from God. About him going to be the father of in him, all the families of the earth being blessed, and now he's going to kill him. Right? Uh, at the direction of God, at the behest of God, he's going to kill his only son, Isaac. That would mean the future is all gone. It's going to stop with me. How is it? If he would have been thinking in a worldly mindset, but how many know Abraham trusted the future to God? He passed this test, so to speak. How many know your future can be trusted with God, too? You said, well, wait a minute, you don't know what I'm facing tomorrow. I don't. It may be tough. It may be real tough. How do you know tomorrow might be the last day? My days might be not. That could be. You said, well, then how do you know that I'll pass, that, that the future test is okay with God because of this? If you are in Christ, if you have been born again, even if that were to happen to you tomorrow or even tonight, now, we never know why right? our next breath isn't promised to us, but do understand this. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for those who are in Christ. And we can say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? For it has been swallowed up and the sting of death has been taken away by Christ and his crucifixion and resurrection for those who are in him. How many are thankful? If you're in Christ... The past, like I said, the past is forgiven and the future is your friend if your future is in Christ. The best days are always, always ahead for the Christian. Aren't you thankful for that? Talk about the glory days. We use the phrase, I'll tell the kids at school, son, back in the day. Anybody ever use that phrase, back in the day? If you're 29, you've used that phrase, back in the day. Somebody say amen because you can think of back in the day. We use that at school all the time. I say, at least that's what my brother tells me. He, he, he's old. No, he's not older than me. I'm a little older than him. But let's we'll say back in the day, back in the day, you may think of the glory days. You may think of your own body. There's things that you maybe used to could do and now maybe can't. I saw these men up here on the roof and I'm, well, I've only ever done a couple different roofing things. I don't have any roofing knowledge. But back in my younger days, I could at least get up there and do what my papa or dad told me to do. Now, if I got up there on the roof, I don't think it'd do too good for me or the roof. <laughs> All right? Uh, uh, but uh, you may think uh, you're getting older and there's some things that you used to could do and now that you can't do and your body, in the words of 1 Corinthians 15, starting to dishonor you a little bit. All right? And anybody can say amen, oh man, help us go, all right? There might, be some, there might be some things that you look back in, your, in the world or the country in which we live and say, well, oh, look at where things are at now and look at where they used to be. Anybody can say that? Right? You don't have to be too old for that to look back and say, never thought I'd see the day. You ever said that? But that having been said, all that could be true. But I'm here to tell you, if you're in Christ, the best days are ahead. The future with Christ is always uh, more glorious than anything we could ever dream or imagine. How many are thankful for that? Where it is that now we see through a glass darkly, one day we'll see face to face every tear that we have shed. He doesn't tell he doesn't tell Gabriel to wipe it from he does it himself. How many are thankful for that? Amen. That it is that those who are in Christ, the future, the best days, the glorious days are always, the most glorious days are always ahead. 
They're a test of our faith to be sure. Anybody who tells you they're not? Now, there are some tests. If you study, on the, if you study the life of Abraham, now I know there were some tests he didn't do so good with. Like he said Sarah was his sister in order to, right, to, not, to not get in trouble. How many remember that sort of thing, right? And they were supposed to leave all this family. I already mentioned that. And he took along with him his dad and his dad. There are some things where he didn't always. But the, I heard someone say this week that the best of men is still a man at best, <laughs> Right? And here it is, is that that can, that can uh, be the case. There, but there will be tests of our faith. There will be tests of our faith to be obedient unto God and for Him to be, uh, you know, the, the most important person, the most important thing in our lives instead of the things of the world crowned and out. There will be tests of our faith fellowship with our brothers and sisters where we know that we need to do everything we can not that it'll always work out, it won't always work out, but to cultivate relationship with our brothers and sisters. That we need to have to fight for the faith and fight for our brothers and sisters. And thanks be to God that some of our brothers and sisters have fought for us. There'll be times when it is that the fortune of this world will be calling and it will be in ungodly ways or to ungodly means or to ungodly ends. And we, by God's grace, want to uh, put that down and follow after him. Amen. There'll be times when we can be prone to be disconcerted about the future or disappointed about the future or uh, not have a, a right outlook upon the future or be fearful of the future. But how many are thankful, even though those, those fears and those doubts will try to creep in, and indeed they do at times, not that there's not things to be concerned about, God knows there is, but how many are thankful that the things to be concerned about if you're in Christ, are nowhere near as great as the God who's concerned about you. Aren't you thankful for that? And here it is that Jesus, he's the ultimate fulfillment. And where Abraham didn't always pass these tests, and Lord knows we haven't always passed these tests, and others, how we're thankful. Jesus, he completed every test, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. How we're thankful we have a Redeemer that passed everything. And that through his shed blood, that record, by God's grace and for his glory, can be accounted unto us. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah. Praise be to his holy name. Let's stand on our feet tonight. Father, we come before you tonight. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, if there is anyone here tonight that knows not Christ, these tests of faith, these things would mean very little to them. Mostly because they talk about spiritual growth in the Christian. But Lord, if there's one here that's not a Christian tonight, then I pray there's been enough of the gospel to come through here this night, especially in this last passage, that where we have sinned and we have fallen short of God's glory and all we like sheep have gone astray, turned everyone into our own way, and nothing we could do to earn our salvation. But whereas Abraham did not have to offer up Isaac, Lord, Jesus was offered up for our sin and he is an acceptable sacrifice and he died to pay the penalty for our sin and he rose up from the grave with life and liberty to all who would repent and put trust in him. And if there's any who know him not tonight, I pray that be convicted by your spirit of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment and drawn into the salvation that's found in Christ alone. And I pray they come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. And Lord, for those who are your children, while there are recent days or many years or decades of our life, we know that there's test of our faith. There are times when we are tried, and none of us like it, to be sure. But yet, as your word declares to us, that the trying of our faith produces patience or endurance and that'll leave us perfect and complete lacking in nothing can have a good result god we pray that you would give us the strength you would give us lord the filling of your spirit and the illumination of the truth of your word and the armor of god to fight by your grace and for your glory away the schemes of the evil one that we indeed will be people that by your grace again and for your glory would fight for our brothers and sisters and fight for the faith that you indeed would be the Lord of uh, all that we are and all that we have for all of our days, that we would not fall for the things of this world, be it 
uh, fortune or philosophy or what it might be, but we would by your grace and for your glory hold true and fast to your word and to the things of God. We pray that we would be people that though this world would cast gloom and despair upon the future and when rightly considered, there's much to be in gloom and despair about when we see things that go on Lord, in, in our own lives and around the world and what have you, in, the, in our own nation and in other things, dear God, we pray that we, your people, would not be those who are filled with gloom and despair, but will be those who know that we can, our redemption is nearer now than when we first believed insofar as the best days are always ahead. And because you live, as the old song says, we can face tomorrow. Because you live, all fear is gone. Life is worth the living just because you, Jesus, live. Lord, help us to follow after you when our faith is tried. Lord, we come to you tonight, and as we've talked about fighting, so to speak, for our brothers and sisters, Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters and needs that are represented here tonight on the list and those unspoken in hearts and in minds. We pray most of all for the salvation of the lost that you would draw our lost loved ones and those that we come into contact with every day and that we would be faithful witnesses of the truth of your gospel. Lord, we pray for this conference coming up this weekend of those who would preach your gospel and pray that you would be glorified and that uh, your people would be edified and those organized in Adam and Raina and others so that you would give strength and grace to all those participating. Lord, we pray tonight for my dad, and I thank you for my brothers and sisters lifting him up and asking me about him tonight in the fellowship hall and here in service. We pray your continued healing touch to be upon him. Pray for strength for my mama, too, who, uh, Lord, is getting very little rest right now. Bless and strengthen her. We pray for our brother Todd's mom. Lord, Carla, we thank you that she's in rehab, and that's a better place than the hospital. We pray you continue to strengthen her and move in her life. Lord, we Lift up to you, Tony. Thank you that he's out of the hospital, and we pray that he would just continue to do better and better, Miss Betty's son. Lord, we lift up to you tonight, Eileen, and we pray for your healing hand to continue to be upon her, as well as for Dave and for our brother Dave here tonight. We pray for him as well. Lord, that you would just continue to touch our brother, give wisdom to the doctors and nurses to be sure, but we pray for your healing hand, O Master Physician, to be upon him. Lord, we lift up to you every request that's upon the list and those known only to hearts tonight. And we pray you minister by your grace and for your glory. And may, may we not fail to give you all the praise and glory for to you and to you alone it belongs now and evermore. In the name of Jesus, we pray in the power of the Spirit we come and all of God's people sin. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is the hope your calling of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of his power extended to all who believe. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name.